So it's been a little while. Sorry you guys, uh, uh, summer kind of got away from me and then September rolled around and you know. But anyway, here I am again. By the time this video comes out, Survivor David vs. Goliath has probably already premiered. Natalie Cole has been voted out first and the Survivor off-season has ended while I continue to trudge through my weird little experiment. This review is special because it's about a season I had never watched up until now. Therefore, I had no personal connection to it prior. But since I live in the world and I'm a Survivor nerd, I knew A, both the results of the season and B, the general consensus of the season. I know the cast is unlikable, I know that Brian is Mr. Freeze, yada yada yada. So I was kind of at least morbidly curious to see how that would play out after the two dull seasons that were Redemption Island and One World. A season with dark undertones? Sounds exciting. But I have to say I was kind of disappointed. Besides one really uncomfortable moment and one semi-psychopathic winner, there just wasn't a lot about the season that was dark. It was more bland more often than not. Let's talk about Thailand. Watching Old Survivor is weird. When the only season of the first 11 you've seen is Borneo, it's almost jarring just how slow everything is. Throughout the first few episodes, it's pretty hard to differentiate anyone besides Helen, Clay, Rob, Sheehan, and of course, since I know the results of the season, Brian. Everyone else is practically a non-entity. I wouldn't be able to pull them out of a lineup. It's only until, say, episode 4 where things start really picking up. The social dynamics of both tribes are clearly defined up to this point, and I will say, once you get to know them, both tribes are pretty interesting. Sook Jai's dysfunctionality as a cohesive group living at camp is wildly entertaining. The constant back and forth between Rob and Sheehan who just can't stand each other for whatever reason. Rob simultaneously getting on everybody else's nerves. Uh, in fact, Sook Jai is uh, more fun than uh, Chewy Gun was at this point, but we'll get to that later. Before I talk about the merge, I neglected to mention the fact that Sook Jai was winning the first few challenges, uh, but then Chewy Gun started winning all of the challenges. So Sook Jai and Chewy Gun at this point are going to the merge at an even numbers of 5-5. Five, five. Sounds like the perfect thing for a deadlock vote. However, she and wanted to jump ship because she didn't really feel like a part of her tribe. She started openly strategizing with the opposite enemy tribe. One problem though. Jeff announces that he never actually said it was a merge, and both tribes are just living together on the same beach for the time being. It's the fake merge! This is the second time in a row I've talked about a season with this little feature, and it's a shame that this admittedly pretty interesting twist was used in seasons that were both panned. I want to say positive things about the twist, but it's hard to deny that this probably has a large hand in the rest of the season becoming super boring. Maybe that's not entirely fair. If they did merge at 10, like they usually do, Xi'an would have very likely jumped shipped, giving Chewie Gun the numbers anyway, meaning we would have been in for a Suk Jai Paganing. But that's simply a hypothetical. For now, all we know is that the fake merge allowed Chewie Gun to win the next two immunities and solidify their numbers over Suk Jai. I will say one thing. I love the way the producers implemented this twist, blindsiding not only the players, but the viewers as well. Survivor had already been going on for a little while now, and it's safe to say that it accumulated a pretty sizable audience up to this point. And this was before merges were like 12 or 13 people. The merge was always at 10 people on day 17. That was always how it had been, so people just naturally assumed that that's how it would be this time. But even before it's announced that it's not a merge, there's already some clues that an eagle-eyed viewer could notice. The fact that Jeff is very careful never to actually say the word merge, the fact that the editors don't title merged tribe under the contestant's name during confessionals like they normally would, the eagle-eyed viewer would probably be able to tell something is up, and it's obvious that the editors and producers gave a lot of thought to this twist. The problem, as I alluded to earlier, is that it makes for a boring season. Chewie Gan just swiftly takes out Suk Jai one by one. And by this point, neither tribe is all that engaging. Chewie Gan is straddling the line between unlikable and boring, and Suk Jai, for all its airtime, was pretty much just focused on the Rob vs. Xi'an feud. So by the time we get to the merge, we barely feel like we know any of these people. Can you name anything significant about Aaron or Penny at all? Or about Jake, besides the fact that he's the oldest member? How about something notable about Ken, besides the fact that Brian maybe thought he was a racist? So before I move on to anything else, there's Little one, a little observation that I think I should point out that may anger a few Survivor peers, but here we go. This season is basically Redemption Island. 
Think about it, an orange tribe and a purple tribe, and the purple tribe wins the first few challenges, but due to their dysfunctionality as a group, they start losing focus, which leads to the orange tribe pulling ahead and winning the next few challenges. All the while on the orange tribe, there's one strategic mastermind that's promising everyone in this tribe final two, but instead he takes the one member that everyone hates because he knows it's the only way he can win. Despite this, he barely wins, and he only does it because he's sitting next to Clay slash Philip. Which brings us to... So, everyone I know pretty much talked about how much of a psychopath Brian is, and how he's a terrible human being even though he's great at the game. At first glance, I didn't see it. Throughout the first couple episodes, he seems nothing but nice to his tribe mates, even giving Tanya kind parting words, almost acting like a big brother. But once you start thinking about it for more than a few minutes, you start noticing things about him that are a little... off. And no, I'm not talking about the fact that he talks to his tribe mates about how he has a deep personal connection with all of them, only then to cut to his confessionals where he calls this nothing but a business trip. That's just Survivor, and I'm honestly surprised we still see this as a bad thing. It's a totally normal and natural way to play this game. The things that make me think he might be an actual psychopath happen at other moments in the season, and also are tertiary aspects of the season, and stuff that happened in the real world. Okay, so you know that unpleasant thing that happened in episode 3 that I've been sidestepping? Well, here it is. But I'm assuming you all know about Grindgate, seeing as how it's really the only one thing that's memorable about this season. In the beginning. It's uncomfortable, it's problematic, and personally I don't really feel like talking about the details. The, the way the situation is handled in all regards is so disgusting that I just don't feel like talking about it any more than I have to. But I do have to talk about it a little bit, so here we go. Hey guys, Gandhi didn't do what she did after the apology because she felt like it would advance her game. At no point in the edit does it seem like that's what she's doing. I nearly realized after thinking about it that she didn't accept his apology and that she was still affected by what Ted did. That's it. So Helen relays this information to Brian because she thinks that since he's a decent human being, he will take Gandhi aside. Now that's not to say that they shouldn't hear Ted's side of the story. That's not even to say that Ted's a malicious or bad person. But the way Brian handles this information is nothing short of disgusting. He asks Ted what happened, and Ted is honestly pretty candid about it. He explains that he made a mistake and that it was dealt with, but that's not what Brian heard. Brian repeatedly says nothing happened, and he just happens to take Ted's side of the story, which isn't even really his actual side, as gospel. And then they use this as an excuse to vote Gandhi out. It's bad. Really, really bad. And this one moment probably makes people remember the season is darker than it actually is. And the reason I didn't explain to you what Ted actually did to Gandhi is because you guys are Survivor fans, and I'm just assuming you all know what Brian Gitt is, and I don't want to have to explain this and talk about it any more than I have to. Brian's sexism is exemplified further when he talks about how just darn happy he is that the women just naturally take the mantle of doing the laundry and cooking. You know, falling in their rightful place the way nature intended. But beyond that, there's nothing really in the actual season that makes me think of him as a bad person. I get the feeling that at the time, audiences were just really mad at him. They had just gotten around to the fact that Richard Hatch turned their awesome survival game into a dumb political numbers game, and you know, they were fine with that. But then this guy comes along, making deals with everybody just so that he can then backstab them later, and then talk about his confessionals about how he doesn't really care about any of these people and he's just using them to get a million dollars. I mean, who does this schmuck think he is? What is he doing? Playing a game? This attitude just must never have left people, and to this day, he still has a reputation as being a monster. When the finale comes, the jury rips into him for portraying them. Hello. And honestly, his answers at Final Tribal are not great. All in all, there's just not anything in this season itself that supports the idea that Brian's a terrible person. Outside of the season, however, there's this common theory that Brian tried to convince Ken to vote Ted out because we can't have two black winners in a row. The idea was that Brian thought Ken was a racist and was therefore trying to bond with him over their perceived shared racism. Uh, apparently this didn't work, allegedly Ken was all like, no, WTF are you talking about? And that was the end of that. This theory is apparently supported by Ken's jury question to Brian. Okay. Ken asks him what Brian told him about why they needed to target Ted. Brian says it was because Ted had trouble fitting into the group. Jeff asks Kim if that was the truth, and Ken dejectedly sits back down and tells him, no, that's not what Brian told me. 
In addition to this theory, there's also this idea that Brian spread rumors about Clay being a racist. Ted accused Clay of making racist remarks, and then at the reunion, he admitted that he heard that rumor from Helen and that he respected her enough to take that to heart. Ob obviously, as Jeff points out at the reunion, this is all hearsay, and there doesn't seem to be any way to prove that these events actually happened. Try as I might, I can't seem to find any evidence to back any of these claims up. It's a very common theory on the Reddit, but when people ask for evidence, they, well, they don't get replied to, and everyone just acts as if it's common knowledge at this point. I do know, however, that in real life, and this is true, that apparently after winning the season, Brian shot a puppy. So with all of this, it sounds like the season's real interesting, right? Well, not exactly. See, all of the really interesting things I mentioned were in tertiary aspects of the season, either not in the edit or having to do with Brian's actions in the real world. The season itself proper is dull. It's not aggressively boring like Redemption Island or One World, just regular boring. The kind of boring that you're kind of interested in throughout like the first 20 minutes of the episode, but then at minute 22, you know, you pick up your phone to scroll through a little bit before paying attention back to the episode. It has a semi-decent pre-merge before relegating into a bagonging of uninteresting characters post-merge. A couple of isolated episodes that are semi-interesting, and then a kick-ass finale where the jury gives the final two a run for their money. Those episodes like the Rob episode or the Helen family visit episode are really good and give insight into those characters as people, but they feel so isolated from the rest of the season, and honestly, I struggle to pinpoint a person that I was rooting for throughout the course of the season, or even pinpoint a running arc that, like, was present throughout the course of the season. Even One World had a better understanding of its season story than Thailand did. Jeff Probst calls this the least likable Final Four. I think of more hateable Final Fours, I do struggle to think of, of a less inspiring Final Four. There's just nothing in this season that inspires excitement. It's simply boring. Not good, or bad, just boring. Right. The hidden underneath this news fest of the season is the story of a psychopath who made all these relationships only to then heartlessly backstab them for a million dollars. But if there is, it's hidden far beneath the surface. Point is, like Game Changers' edit of Sarah, the edit just really didn't focus too much on Brian as the villain. It was only in tertiary aspects and in one or two confessionals. And then the finale rolls around and everyone treated Brian as a villain, and that was really interesting, but there wasn't enough of that. Brian isn't enough of a villain. A couple of confessionals where he talks about how he's going to have to backstab Helen and Ted further down the road is not enough of a story. That's just the game. That's just how the game is played. I'm sorry if this review seems disjointed, but to me, the season as a whole felt disjointed, and this was the only way for me to talk about the only interesting aspects of the season. And there are a couple. The only problem is they don't have much to do with each other.